Welcome to the Creation Innovation Podcast. I'm your host, Elizabeth King. Together, we'll have conversations with incredible human beings who have taken their creative outlet and turned it into something innovative. From people leaving the corporate world to be eight-figure entrepreneurs to people who have created books, created a family, or just creating to have fun in the world. We are all in a journey to create something amazing in our lives, and I hope that you find some inspiration of your own here. This is the Creation Innovation Podcast. Hey, everyone. Welcome back to the Creation Innovation Podcast. I'm super excited today to talk to Kavita. She is a female business owner, entrepreneur, author, television personality, mama, as we were just talking about, and has taken her passion and turned it into a successful career. So welcome. And I can't wait to hear about everything that you've created. There's so much here. (laughs) There's a lot. There's a lot. (laughs) Yes. So first of all, tell us about kind of your background and where, how you got to where you are in a general sense. Where are you now? Actually, it looks like you're somewhere exotic. Oh, this is my office. Okay. Beautiful. <laughs> Thank you. I'm in Fort Lauderdale. So okay. see the beautiful intercoastal that you probably don't want to jump in because the, the water quality is probably not good. It's right behind me, but if you have a boat, it's fun to sail in. <laughs> nice. Nice. Yeah. So are you originally from Florida? I am from London. I'm, I was born in London, but I moved to Florida when I was five. And no matter where like the world has taken me, like I lived in LA for a year, I lived in, I studied abroad in Spain for six months. Um, I went to school at University of Florida. I've always come back to South Florida. It's just home. I know. That's how I am about same story, essentially, but always back to Orange County where I'm at right now. But uh, yeah. Not a bad place to be, the OC. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> Although we're we're looking to potentially move out, but that's another story. Oh, wow. Yeah. Um, so what's that? Where? Well, we looked at Texas, we looked at Nashville, we want to look at Florida, so kind of all those places. So we'll see. But my husband's from the East Coast, so he's like, why would we ever leave here? You know, the weather is perfect pretty much all the time. I so, know. Yeah. <laughs> so tell us a little bit about all these amazing things that you've created. You've created a family, you've created yeah. businesses, you've created a product. Like, start wherever you want to start, but we want to hear it all. Well, it's funny because yesterday was my birthday. Oh, happy and- birthday. <laughs> Thank you. And my my social media guy, Kyle, who's amazing, he created this reel for me from like when I was a baby and like all these different things I've done over the years. And it's funny because like half of my friends and just people that I've met in the past few years that only know me as like Kavita, the winemaker, they were like, oh my God, I didn't know you did all those things. <laughs> and it was so cool to have this little capsule, this like little yeah. I don't know, capsule. I mean, I watched it probably like 20 times. Like, what? Yay, Kyle. Yeah, I know. That was amazing. But um, it's funny because um, when I was a little kid, I was actually talking with my friend the other day and it's like, I have two small children, you have three. And, you know, when kids are little, they tell you, you ask them like, what do you want to be when they, when you grow up? And whatever they say just sounds so like silly to adults. And you're just like, they're just saying that because they like this at this time. Actually, no, kids kind of know what they want. There's some like truth to what they're saying. You know, when I was a kid, I used to wear lampshades on my head and I used to like hold a hairbrush and like run around like I was like an announcer or, you know, on stage or something. And my parents, well, my mom was just like, oh, it's just being funny, you know? And then I spent so many years, went to college to try and do the normal thing, get the job, the corporate America job and all that. And just to go back to TV, which is what yeah. I wanted to do when I was little. So Anyway, that was my little story. Um, I, I My background's TV and I worked for Fox Sports. Um, I covered the NFL. I covered um, NHL, MLB, basketball, all of it. Wow. It was kind of like CrossFit type of thing. And I also did entertainment. And in 2016, I took a trip to Provence and like Italy. It was like a month long trip. Um, you know, I needed a break because I was working like all the different seasons of sports and I was, I wanted to spoil myself. I'm like, let's go to Europe. Yeah. So, <laughs> to this trip. And prior to that, I only liked really red and white wine. I wasn't a rosé drinker. But when I went to this beautiful, on this beautiful trip and I went to all these different um, locations and hotels, they would always give me a glass of rosé. Especially in Provence, right? I feel like when in Rome. <laughs> <laughs> and the funny thing is, even in Italy, like they give me Italian rosé, you know? Yeah. And I just fell in love. And so I came back to the United States, 
so stoked about the trip. And then I would go to all my favorite restaurants and I would order rosé. I'd like, first, can I taste it? I don't like this one. Can I taste the next one? I don't know. And then there'll only be like three on the list and I hated them all. Uh-huh. I was like, there's no way the wine I drank from France tastes the way it does. And then the wine we have here tastes the way it does. It's like not comparable. And don't you think part of that too is like when you're in that vibe there and you just kind of remember like how you felt there and whatever. And I think we're always trying to recreate I know. that feeling by whatever it is that you're drinking. So I can totally appreciate you trying to figure out how to recapture that vibe of being there. Cause I feel like that's, you know, that's it, right? It is like, those are the memories, those memories yes. that you have and then you want to recreate them to give you that feeling. So I went to uh, France, like, you know, first I was thinking what, what like start a rosé. This is like a weird thought I have. I'm, I'm covering the NFL. I'm working in sports. Like who am I to even, I don't know anything about rosé. Yeah. So <laughs> just that I like it. So then I started researching. I, I spoke with different like people in the business and I found out about this conference and it was like a rosé conference, but it was only for winemakers. And so I'm like, how am I going to get in this? And of course I, I, I said, listen, I, I, I'm a media, I'll cover it on social media. Mm-hmm. And that's, and then I got in and then I ended up trying all these different wines. I met with all these different winemakers. It was three days, probably over a hundred winemakers. And then I found one that I wanted to work with. And here we are almost five years later. And every time I do have a sip of Chenet Rosé, it does bring me back to San Tropez. Yes. Okay. <laughs> I need to, I need to get some of that because oh, yeah. that's kind of my, my, having that connection and knowing that story means so much because now I feel like when, when I get to try that, I can just picture that. Right. And for me, you know, the idea of Provence and the, the fields with all the lavender and, you know, and, or the coast of France, like, I cannot wait, especially now that it's starting to warm up a little bit. I had my first glass of rosé this last week, actually. Um, I'm very much like a seasonal wine drinker. (laughs) Okay. Well, I will tell you, well, number one, our our, our rosé is no sugar, low sulfites, but I want to break that myth of rosé in the summer. I just right. went to Aspen last week because we opened up in Aspen. We're in a bunch of awesome, awesome restaurants in Aspen yeah. and, um, and hotels. And people drink lots of rosé in the snow. It's like the sexiest thing. Picture white snow totally. and a gorgeous glass of rosé. Yeah. No, oh, I, I'm down for it. I, that's right. my own like crazy thing that I'm, I think I'm breaking out of because it was yeah. early February and I already was, you know, granted we're in California, but still, um, yeah. I'm, I will soon be one of those people. So, oh yeah. Good. Um, <laughs> and was the whole process of creating this easier or more difficult than you thought it would be? Like when you thought, okay, I'm going to do this. I mean, d- d- I don't even know where to start with that because I think there's I so many ideas of like, where do we, like, who are you up against? How does that even work? Where do you start? And did you learn all of this at the conference? I mean, no, no. It was a process. It was very, well, number one, I'm weird. I just always jump into things and then I figure things out, which is the opposite yeah. of what any intelligent person would tell you to do. <laughs> yeah. um, but that's just me. Like, you know, I, so I'm, you know, I, I basically went to Provence. Obviously I tried all the different rosés. It was great. Cause I got to know the different flavor profiles from the different regions. You know what I mean? And I knew, I knew what I liked and I figured, listen, like, I'm going to have to love the product. If I'm going to sell it, it has to be something that I love. And hopefully everybody else, like so many people will have that same taste and will love that same wine. Yeah. And um, so it was really difficult because obviously, well, at that time it was 2016, 17. And really the only rosé brands that I knew were like Miraval, Whispering Mm -hmm. Angel, and maybe like two or three more. But when I did launch, uh, number one, the rosé was that good that my boyfriend and I then ended up getting pregnant. (laughs) (laughs) Cheers to that. Yeah. (laughs) And I, so now I'm, I'm thinking, now I'm faced with this challenge of, do I want to, I'm a first time mom. Um, do I want to have this baby and focus on the baby or do I still want to launch my business and focus on my baby and be a first time mom, you know? Yeah. And were you still doing TV at the time as well? I was, I was, but I just, I I wasn't doing it as intensely because I was focusing more on the wine. Um, but I was doing like one-off things, you know, I I still, I still do now. I enjoy it, but I, I I love my business more. Um, so, (laughs) and I, I was faced with that challenge because a few of my friends, um, and even my kid's father were like, you know, maybe you don't have to do this. Like you've already done all the work and you're, but you, you don't have to do it. Like, you know, you can just, you know, focus on being a mom or whatever. So I thought, you know what, like everything's hard. I mean, what am I going to sit here? Like 
I can do this. You know what I mean? Yeah. Whether I'm not doing it or I am, everything is still hard and it's still fun and it's still an adventure. Just go for it. And that's what I did. And it was difficult because at that time, now other people had the same idea as me. They all of a sudden, these different rosé brands popped up and I'm like, oh my gosh, like here I am thinking I'm, I'm doing like market research. And I'm thinking that I only have like seven competitors and now I have like right. 30, you know right. what I mean? And not only that, I'm going around trying to sell rosé pregnant. <laughs> <laughs> You're like, I promise you it's really delicious. I can't drink it with you right now, but yeah. I know, I know. Yeah. Some of, I'm sure some of those sales I got because they like felt bad for me. And then the other ones, they <laughs> Whatever were like, works. <laughs> the other ones, they were like, this is weird. The places that didn't carry me were like, this is weird probably. And then, you know, I ended up having a kid. I got pregnant eight months after my daughter was born. So a lot of it was like, and you know, your mom, um, I, I, a lot of it was like, I breastfed both for like a year or so. I, I, it's not like I could really drink during those first three years of our launch. I mean, I could have a sip here and there, but I wasn't going to like dump my milk. You know? <laughs> right. So the liquid gold as we refer to it. Right. Um, so it was challenging. And then, but I kept going. And the one cool thing about business is I always tell people, you don't have to be the best. You don't have to have the most money. You just, if you just keep going, like there'll be this many people trying to do what you're doing. And then if you just keep going, like they're going to drop out and then yeah. you're still going to be there. Do you know what I mean? Right. Yeah. That's what I was going to ask you. When you started to see that the market was getting more saturated, did you just kind of keep blinders on and yes. like, keep going? Or were you like freaked out about that fact? And did that derail you at all? Because I think a lot of people when they're starting their businesses, and they're like, No, it's, it's too saturated, or there's, you know, so many people that are already doing this, or I'm not as good as Susie Q or Joe yeah. Schmo. And so then they they're like, forget it. And I think that as an entrepreneur, that is a really common struggle to just yeah. say, we got to keep going forward. What was your strategy to kind of block that out? Or to just, well, you know, keep your eye on the prize, so to speak. Well, I feel like how you do something is how you do everything. And I'm just not a quitter, except yeah. when I'm on the treadmill. I always, if I'm doing 30 minutes, I always stop at 29. I don't know why. <laughs> I don't want to go that extra last minute. <laughs> but, um, you know, I just felt like I, I had this great idea. It came to me for a reason. My angels like are sending me inspiration. It wasn't like I was, I I was born thinking I wanted to, you know, make wine. So it came from somewhere. I trusted that somewhere had my best interest. And even though there were all these other competitors out there, I felt like my product, there was enough room for all of us. And I felt like my product had its own place, you know, and fast forward to today. I mean, people did try and convince me along the way. Are you sh like Rose? Everybody has Rose. Why don't you switch to this, switch to that? We'll do this, blah, blah, blah. And I'm just like, no, because if I keep listening to other people, it just becomes a mess. Right. We've all seen that happen as entrepreneurs with other projects. I'm sure I'm, yeah. I'm sure you've seen it happen too. So I just kept the course. And then what we did was, um, I, the funny thing is, is I, the company was Shanae Rose, but then I thought I want to why did I name it? I was probably prego brain. Why did I name it Shanae Rosé? Because, you know, I want to start other wines beside Rosé. So then last year we switched it to Sip Shanae. And we also have a white wine, which is Shanae Blanc. And it turns out at first, everyone thought I was crazy to launch a white wine. Um, it turns out that that is like our, our hit. I mean, our Rosé is our hit, but I'm saying in places where say a whispering angel or a Miraval or like a big, big brand dominates that market. Cause maybe they're, I don't know, doing whatever they're doing. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> they'll carry my white. And so it's like, okay, well you, you have this deal with whispering angel. Well, we've got a white Chenet Blanc and they're like, so let's take it. Awesome. Yeah. So it's really awesome. And you know, I look up to a lot of people, like a lot of my competitors, I'm, I'm in the Hamptons in the summer and Joey Wolfer, who has her own vineyard and she's got um, summer in a bottle. Um, I've met her a handful of times and we talk shop. I've met um, Bon Jovi, who has Hampton water. Uh, I've met the, the people from La, La Fette and I'm very good friends with the owner of that. And then I've met, I've met all the different rosé winemakers and I don't, feel like, oh, you suck. Mine's better. Yeah. I love them all. Like, I wish we could yeah. all band together and just like, you know, have all of our brands be one. You yeah. know what I mean? one. And I think that that's such a new aspect and new way to view working and being an entrepreneur and really saying we're all collaborating for the collective of yeah. people that are out there that enjoy wine, right? In your case. And oh. really just changing that narrative of 
we're not competing, competing against each other. We're helping each other out, right? What have you learned? How can that help me, et cetera? And I know in just my industry, that's very much the way now, which is so beautiful compared to how it was even 10 years ago, I feel like yeah. where you would be like, oh, we can't let them know what's happening or who our team is or what whatever's happening because it just changes how you show up as well. Yeah and everyone else right to just say we there's enough to go around for everyone and coming to the table with a, an idea of abundance for everyone yes. right yeah i mean it's like even on instagram like i see you know joey or or john bon jovi or whomever like posting something love other brands i'm liking it i'm saying like if they if they have like a big milestone i'm like that's amazing like i just yeah. I feel like it's just so much better to be supportive. And I feel like it's a collective, you're right, a collective energy right now, because I think maybe 20 years, about 20 years ago, everybody was just kind of like, you know, I'm better than you. And it was not that same vibe. Yeah, and exactly. It is, that, it is now. I mean, I, I notice more and more people are that way and I'm so glad. And what a fun <laughs> industry to be in, like wine and like, that's awesome. I know. But, I'm, very, I'm very tired though. It's hard being a mom and then being at all, at all these events and you know, whining every day. <laughs> so that was going to be my segue to the next conversation is tell us about being a mom and being a single mom and an entrepreneur. And what is that like? And how do you juggle all of that? I know it's, I know from my experience, it's not easy and yeah. you're, I'm always tired and I feel like it's just this window. I know I got to get through it, but yeah. it's been a long window and I'm sure it has for you too. So how do you manage that? Well, my kids were 18 months apart and I feel like when they were up to like, um, maybe three, they were very easy to deal with. I loved the whole, I was very regimented with the breastfeeding. I was very, without sleeping. I, of course I didn't do it all myself. I have an amazing yeah. nanny, uh, <clears throat> but I, I, when they can't really talk and they just like do whatever you ask them to do, or, mm -hmm. you know, you just have to direct them and they follow along, right? Yeah. They can walk. Now that they have their own minds, it's a little more difficult because I'm constantly getting pushed back. And then right. of course, since we're busy, sometimes I snap at them where before that I was like, Montessori, respectful care, never raise my voice. And then now I find myself like snapping and I'm like, oh my God, I'm like, me, mom, stop. No, I know. <laughs> it's, it's a hard line to toe because it does get frustrating and, you know, yeah. and they're not listening and and trying to, I think, same as a work collective, as parents, we know so much better now. We, yeah. we have such a better view of how to parent and what our parenting is doing to them. So we try okay. to be very cognizant and conscious of what we're doing. So I feel like it's even more difficult when we catch ourselves being that way, because we're like, oh no, like, what did we just do? Did we just really mess them up? Like, at least I know that's for me. <laughs> no, you're a thousand percent right. Like, I, I feel like I, I need, I need someone to come in and show me how to handle when my kids, my two kids are fighting at each other. Like, it's almost like they don't even hear me. Yeah. I can just be like, Hey, no, they're in the zone and nothing can stop them. You know what I mean? Yeah. And I'm a single mom and it's not like I have the dad to scare them. I can't say like, I'm going to tell that they have a dad. I mean, he sees them whenever he wants, but you know, he doesn't live here. So it's not yeah. like I can say, you know, I'm going to get daddy. Like my mom would do. And I'd be like, so scared when I was a kid. Right. You know? I mean, it's, it's, it's difficult, but you know, they do whenever I go to events are like, mommy, you're going to work again, you know? And I'm like, well, at least I get to be with you all day and you're going to sleep in an hour anyway. Yeah. You know? <laughs> and I think that's hard too, as they're getting older, because they are more aware of like when yeah. we're working and our time and where our time goes and everything. Whereas as they were smaller, I think it was a little easier to get away with it, you know? A lot easier. So, and I also don't want as much as I, you know, run two businesses and I want them to see that and be proud of their mom. I also don't want them to be resentful about work right and to no. be like working is bad because it oh. takes our mom away you know so i i feel like again that's something that i'm always trying to toe the line so that they understand as as best as they can in their little brains of what's happening and why it's happening and all those things but i know yeah. you know it's actually cute because my daughter um i sometimes when i'm like doing something if i'm filming something or if i'm like talking to somebody or whatever like all and she's with me like we're at dinner or whatever it is or in the house I see her like glancing over, like I see her like looking at me like this. <laughs> and it's so cute because I, I feel like she sees that I'm doing something that I enjoy. And yeah. she's always like, mommy, why can't I come with you? And then she says, Shanae Rose. And I'm thinking, oh my gosh, am I like, is my, am I a bad mom? Is my daughter going to like, I don't want. And then I tell her, listen, you don't need to drink wine. And then she's like, but why do you? And I'm like, <laughs> you know. 
It's, we'll it's talk about it later. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <Mommy abuse. laughs> exactly. Exactly. So, and you've also written a children's book. How, yeah. how did that come about? So oh, we, sweet. Frederick the Hamptons frog. And actually we're almost done. The second one's done, but we're almost done with the illustrations. Um, the second one, this is Frederick the Hamptons frog. He was in the Hamptons. And the second one, Frederick goes down to Fort Lauderdale, which is pretty cool. That is but, cool. Um, yeah. So this, this came about because we, we went to the Hamptons for the first time. And during like, right after COVID, we had a rental, there was a frog in the pool. The frog would not get out of the pool. Aww. I tried to get the pool guy to get him out. You know, I tried to get him out. He wouldn't come out. So when we got back to Florida, well, we ended up swimming around in the pool with him. I'd have friends over and he'd be like swimming next to us. And I'm like, just disregard him. It's, he's been here longer than me. So we, we go back to Florida and I started having all these like dreams one night about like the lyrics. It's a rhyming uh, book. And then I just woke up. Well, I voice noted them to myself. And the next day I woke up and wrote the book and I'm like, this is, a, I love this story. And then it's cool. Cause it, you know, it has, it's not insinuated, but it has a single mom in it, which is cool. And I don't think there's a lot of children's books out there without the oh, mom. Yeah, so beautiful. I like it. Yeah. And we, so with that as well, did, was that process easier than you expected? I mean, you said yeah. like, you make it sound so easy, right? I voice memoed it in my phone and then here we are, like, here's this gorgeous book. How Actually, was that process for anybody listening who's thinking about writing a book? A book is harder than launching wine. Oh like, no. <laughs> yeah, it's just more intensive. It's more, there's a lot of things you gotta do. All right, so this is what happens. You write the book, that's the easiest part. Now you have to have the illustrations done, right? And you gotta do all, you gotta register, you gotta get the ISBN number, you gotta figure that out. You gotta figure out if you're self-publishing. If you're trying to get a publisher, good luck. It's gonna take three years. Yeah. So, um, you know, I self-published and then I launched on Amazon, which trying to figure out how to do that is very difficult. And then once you're in Amazon, you gotta do all the keywords and you gotta do all these little things that are just not of interest to me. And I tried to get my assistant to help me with, and it made my brain like, ah. yeah, I was like, no, I need to be a bestseller. We got to do everything we got to do. So then I consulted with this amazing girl, Ashley from LA, who's like a book coach. And I said, listen, this is not my industry. You just tell me what to do. I'll do it. Create a plan for me. I'll do it. Yeah. She said, you got to create, create a launch team. And then you got to have everyone on that day beforehand you know, send them the book. And then on that day, around the same time, all those people have to post about your book. And then you got to pray that people actually buy it. And then maybe you'll be a bestseller. Or you can, if you want to be a New York Times bestseller, you can actually, which a lot of people do. And, you know, it's unfortunate because it's not really genuine is they buy all their books. If you have like millions of dollars, you can buy a million copies of your book and then you're on the bestseller list. Oh. So yeah. There's, there's always that route. <laughs> so I went with the less expensive route and I created a launch team and, uh, you know, I, and I actually, I went on Instagram and I would just like search things like librarians, school teachers, whatever. And I just contacted people that I didn't even know. And I just said, listen, I wrote this book. If you like it, would you please, I'm going to send it to you. If you like it, would you please be a part of the launch team? Um, and I had probably like 50 people. And we became, we were on the bestseller list in that first week. Yeah, we were number three on the bestseller list. Congratulations. <laughs> Yo, and what are the, what are your one. little, sorry? I said the next book has to be number one. I'm competitive against myself. All right, let us know. We'll, we'll be on, we'll be ready to hit the buy button. Um, and how, what do your littles think about the book? Oh, they love it because like the, they think it's, I mean, it looks like them. So they. Oh, sweet. They love it. They love it. But it's funny, actually, because one of these uh, stores in the Hamptons, we tried to sell the book to uh, the lady said, um, very popular store. She said, I don't like this book. It looks too much like Disney. And then oh. so I and so I, I told my assistant afterwards, I said, I'm so happy. That was the best compliment. Ever. I was going to say that's what I was going for. So yeah. Thank you. <laughs> I was gonna say, since when is that? I mean, at last I checked, Disney's doing pretty well. So yeah. And so, you know, I wrote the second one gonna write the third it'll be a trilogy and then hopefully i can find someone to sell it to disney and make it a movie yeah <laughs> sounds awesome well thank you so much for being here where can everyone find you find your wine all the yeah. things okay now we know the books on amazon exactly the easiest the book makes a great gift too the easiest way you guys can find me is on instagram at kavita shanae instagram at kavita shanae and then it has like all my wine the book all that stuff on there all right. Well, we can't wait to go order ourselves some wine and read our books. 
while drinking our wine even. And I know. I'm going to need your help actually, but we'll talk about that, you know, another time, but you know, there may be some other babies in the future, Elizabeth, because I heard yes. the, the mastermind behind a lot of women and their fertility. Let's do it. Let's make some babies. It's our favorite thing to do. <laughs> Thank you All right. Us. Thanks, Kavita. So, please. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of the Creation Innovation Podcast. Make sure to follow us on Spotify for free episodes and subscribe to the Creation Innovation Podcast on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you choose to get your podcast. Don't forget to rate and review the podcast wherever you're listening for a chance to receive a special gift. Yes, we actually do send out gifts. It's my favorite thing to do. So visit us at elizabethking.com backslash creation innovation for more information on how to enter. Every review counts and we are so grateful. You can follow me at the official Elizabeth King on Instagram or TikTok. Until next time.